the president. I congratulate you on the election to such a prestigious position. I congratulate all the new members of this chamber. I also thank all the members returning and new for their warm welcome. My presence here today started with the kindness and generosity of the Australian people, true to the spirit of our nation anthem. For those who come across the seas, we boundless plans to share with courage, let us all combine to advance Australia fair. I'm standing here today to deliver my first speech in this chamber. My journey to parliament has been long and widening. To truly understand a person, one must dig deep and learn his or her journey rather than his or her destination. And so I beg your indulgence. Before coming to Australia, life was all about survival for my family. My parents escaped from the communist hell North Vietnam and fled to South Vietnam in an act of survival and to live a life without fear. They both joined a paratrooper division in the Republic of South Vietnam's military, where they met. This was before conscription, mind you. They felt so strongly about protecting freedom that they volunteered to enlist. And more so remarkable for a woman in that era to voluntarily join such an elite and dangerous unit. I was their first child. And in what seemed to be a continuation of horrid luck for my parents, I was diagnosed with a critical illness. They prepared to sell whatever they had and do whatever it took to cure me. All of the biggest hospital in Saigon refused to take a chance on what was seen as a hopeless case, except one. Except one French hospital, perhaps our mercy or an intrigue to experiment on an unusual ailment. On the day of the operation, with the money for a cab ride, my parents walked kilometers with me, a baby, in their arms. They arrived at the hospital only to learn that the operation was canceled so that the surgeon could celebrate the coming Christmas. As fate had it, the relative of another patient overheard the conversation and suggested to my parents to try a doctor specializing in herbal medicine. Out of desperation, my parents sought out the doctor, and thanks to whom I survived without any surgery. As a child, I went to bed, not with the harmonies of lullabies, but amidst the sound of explosion from artillery and bombs. I was mostly fed, not on the milk of my mother, who was often away on mission, but with sweetened condensed milk bought from army supplies. In my childhood, I often witnessed the violence and atrocities of war. Death and destruction fell upon so many around me that soon I perceived everything from the sudden of explosions and the echoes of gunfire as less than extraordinary and rather simply ordinary. Then 1975 came. The communists took over South Vietnam, but the war did not end there. The victors opened up another front on the people of the South. They sent hundreds of thousands to the so-called re-education camps in the most remote corners of the country. There were no sentenced terms. The detained had to stay in the camp until deemed sufficiently re-educated at the pleasure and mercy of the authorities. Some were there for that case. Many did not survive. To this day, Countless bodies have never been found. Meanwhile, their families were not spared either. They were stripped of their livelihood, their houses confiscated, and the people sent to new economic zones to endure hardship. Education and employment were dished out based on personal history. The history of not just oneself, but of one three generations. Opportunities were reserved only for party members and their families. It was a realization of all wealth were. All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. We simply had to find a way to escape Vietnam by whatever means for a life of freedom, a life without oppression and fear. 
we tried so many times, all failed. On two occasions of despair and desperation, we tried a petrol tanker with a tank about 80 meters long and two meters high, divided into three chambers. We plan to drive the tanker into the sea and float the tank as a vessel with a fitted engine and propeller to the end chamber. The daring escape did not eventuate. The tanker did not make it to the seas, to the waters, as it became bogged down in the sand. It may still be on display today somewhere in central Vietnam. On another occasion, a boat capsized with more than 30 of my close friends. <coughs> More, <clears throat> more than 30 of my close relatives on board, most did, make it, did not make it. In the end, <clears throat> we split up, and I boarded a small boat of 30 meters long and four meter wide, together with 107 other souls. We endured five days and five nights at sea with very little food and water. Each person received about two canteen capfuls of water per day. To further exasperate the matters, we were attacked by pirates not once, but twice. Not sort of a miracle, we somehow make it to the shores of Malaysia. But we were the lucky few. Others have gone to unimaginably horrendous stories. Many perished at sea because of starvation, of thirst, or by the hand of pirates. There is no way to know the exact number of those who die. Some estimates put it at hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children. Those are the deaths I will live for, so I vow to myself. <clears throat> Year later, I had the chance to dedicate my PhD thesis at the University of Edinburgh to my parents, my teachers, and to my high sea companion, the boat people. The Australians came to the Malaysian refugee camp, took us in on humanitarian grounds, and gave us safe passage to Brisbane in 1980. When I first arrived in Australia, I could not believe that there could exist such a humane society outside of fairy tales. Opportunities were abundant, and I took them with open arms. Starting, <coughs> starting right away, I took a job as a laborer working with asbestos, for some time before barging my way into the University of Queensland, where I was awarded the University Gold Medal upon graduation. The Commonwealth Scholarship and Fellowship Plan then took me to the University of Edinburgh for my PhD studies. After that, I spent three years as a research fellow at the University of Oxford before returning to Australia to take up a fellowship at the University of Melbourne in 1991. Then the position at CSIRO, Professor, Professor of Fellowship at Swinburne University of Technology and Melbourne University. My mathematical background has also afforded me the opportunity to double in financial algorithmic trading in data science and artificial intelligence. Science has been my passion and still is one of the loves of my, wife, of my life. Science is full of wonders and order, the kind of orderliness that I often sought refuge in during my teenage years in Saigon. Signs were an escapism to get away from the surrounding chaos and cruelty. Signs has taken me to many magnificent institutions around the world, as a Fulbright scholar at Columbia University, to visiting scientists at MIT and Princeton Institute for Advanced Study. I have made many lifelong friends in the scientific circle. I have had my fair share of discovery and of course, controversies. Given that background, I am very much interested in science issue and policy for our state. Australia is often regarded as a lucky country with abundant raw resources. But in our time and age, we have to compete in a, an, an environment of increasingly sophisticated science, technology, and innovation. The low hanging fruits have been harvested. Genetic engineering, data science, and artificial intelligence, to name a few, are now crucial 
for new economic growth. Quantum computers, quantum algorithms, and quantum technology in general are advancing at great speed thanks to the investment in advanced countries and economies. They will, pay, they will be paying huge dividends not too far a future, if not already, in creating new applications and markets. Science and technology have been impacting many aspects of our lives, our living standards, our culture, and even social justice. Advances in renewable energy technologies and extreme climate management in particular will be coming from scientific research and technological breakthroughs. Science and technology together co-evolve in a symbiotic manner. Victoria leads not only the nation but also the world in some fields of scientific research. We need to nurture and expand our scientific advantage. Research and development is expensive, but it is not only an investment in our state, but the world itself. The Victorian Labour government over the last two decades have invested heavily in R&D, which has given our state undeniable advantages in scientific advancement, but we could always do more. We could always ship our resources to suitably targeted areas as the times in which we live now present global catastrophe as a commonplace concern rather than a rarity. Our own supply of skills in science technology is in serious shortage. The trend indicates a steady decline in the number of young people having an interest in the subject of STEM, science, technology, and engineering, and mathematics. To address the decline, we need to start with high school students, if not younger. We need to encourage more participation in STEM as subjects of excitement and intrigue, as well as of relevance and for own genders. As a person driven to science at a relatively young age, thanks to the influence of my teachers, I appreciate very much their role in guiding and imparting not only their knowledge, but also their passion to students. I will try to have more teachers not only given the resources to become highly skilled in educating students in the field of STEM, but also to foster a climate where their passion and interest is undeniably contagious to their students. Furthermore, furthermore, another pursuit that I have endeavored upon pertains to the importance of multiculturalism. In our state of Victoria, nearly 50% of the population were born overseas or have at least one parent born overseas. The southeastern metropolitan region that I represent is the most culturally and linguistically diverse region of Victoria, with people coming from nearly 160 ethnic groups and nationalities, and more than 200 languages spoken. Springvale, in particular, boasts a diverse population where more than 70% of people were born outside Australia. The city of Greater Dandenong is the most multicultural and multi-faith place on earth. Such a success does not just happen by chance. It demands the deep commitment of all the people involved. It requires the unity in common values of liberty, justice, and equal opportunity. Our workforce and our entire economy are strongest when we embrace diversity to its fullest. And that means opening doors of opportunity to everyone, as Tom Perrett put it. Labor acknowledges that migration promotes significant long-term society and economic benefits to our society. Labor welcomes migrants into our community, including many who come as refugees or people seeking asylum. Labor understands the need to raise awareness of the benefits of a vibrant and tolerant community that balances cultural identity with the need to recognize and respect the beliefs of others. Victorian labor government's multicultural policy with its supporting campaign, 
Victorian and power of it, has reaffirmed our government's commitment to the ideals of multiculturalism and continue to provide a positive way forward for maintaining our strong and socially inclusive society. But we too must remember that the cultures that make up a multicultural society have their own needs. Take the Indo-Chinese community as an example. Many young people came to these shores, escaping their war-torn countries of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos in the, in the 70s and 80s. They have worked hard and contributed extensively to their family, community, and country. Now, more than 40 years later, they, they and their parents are reaching the stage of their lives where care, where there is a home care, residence, residential care, or health care in general is needed. Edge care is a growing problem of demand and supply for our society, as our population is aging fast, particularly with the baby boomers generation, and more so for ethno-specific age care requirements. The care provided must be appropriate to their culture, religion, language, and dietary needs. This will ensure that both their welfare and dignity are cared for. The Andrews Labor government already has long-term plans and investment commitments to support ethno-specific aged care. But with the coming wave of care requi requirements for the post-1975 refugees from Indochina, further consideration and planning will be needed urgently. Above mentioned are some areas of my passionate interest, and I look forward to working with the concerned minister and all parliamentary members to make further progress in these domains. The Buddha has taught us that gratitude is necessary for integrity. Today is the second day of the Lunar New Year of the pig. It is, in our tradition and custom, the occasion to pay respect to our ancestor on this day. And I would like to add to that, those who fought for and died for are still fighting for freedom and for basic rights of humans. I am beholden to my parents for all the sacrifices they made. I am grateful to all my teachers and my mentors who have shown me the possibilities turning a sometimes wayward boy to the person I am. I am a better person thanks to you in no part. I simply cannot name all the individuals who have helped me, but I want to specifically thank Hong Kang, Lai Kung, Chung Doang, Tung Dao, Hong Dao, Kim Doang, Daniel Molino, Anthony Byrne, Adam Somjurak, Ben Davis, Steve Michelson, Declan Williams, and especially Luke Donnellan for introducing and unflinchingly supporting me in my political endeavors and for the instrumental help for my campaign. I also want to acknowledge the help from the Australian Worker Union, the community, the supporters, volunteers, and my friends, many of whom are here today in the gallery. Thank you. And I'm so glad that our paths have crossed. Words are insufficient to express my debt and gratitude to my wife of 39 years for everything. For everything. From giving up her food ration in the refugee camp to feed an exhausted and hungry husband to sharing with me all the burdens and hardship that life has thrown at us. Without her love, encouragement, support and understanding, I would not be here, I would not be where I am today. To my beloved daughters, I am proud of you. I am honored to be a part of the labor movement. It is unflinching in its elevation of inclusiveness, progressiveness, and the right for everyone to find opportunity equally. I have participated in social and community activities for nearly my entire adult life, from volunteering during my student days to eventually founding multiple volunteer media organizations, some lasting over 20 years. 
My participation in politics at this stage of my life, even though I have never dared to dream or believe that it was possible when I first setting foot in Australia, is yet another attempt to repay this country. I'm humble and I am humble to be elected, and I take with utmost seriousness my responsibility for the community as well as for my constituency who has bestowed, bestowed upon me the great honor and privilege to serve. I have had a second life full of possibility, all thanks to Australia. For that, I am eternally grateful. I owe this country an unrepayable debt. Only all I can do is try to reduce that debt, and I assure you I do my best.